So welcome to the Secure Dynamics panel cast. I have two former guests who've been on TechCast before. I have uh, Arthi Arora Raman, who is uh, the CEO at uh, Titanium Labs, and I have Brian Kelly, who heads up uh, the security and privacy vertical inside of Educos. So quick introduction, Arthi, why don't you go first, and Brian, then we'll get started. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Ashwin. Yes, um, I am the founder and CEO of Titanium. We are a data protection company and uh, definitely trying to make a difference in uh, some of the compromises on the data and privacy side, but very interested in chatting about what it takes to get in in the security space. So thank you for having me again. Absolutely. Yeah. And thanks for having me back. I'm Brian Kelly, as you mentioned. I'm with, cyber, uh, with Educause in their cybersecurity and privacy program, really supporting the higher ed practitioner. So a lot of what I do is connecting and collecting sort of the, the dots and the humans. So this is great from a, a relationship standpoint and to talk a little bit about what it takes uh, to survive and to get in and, and be here. So thanks for having me. Great, so Brian, why don't we continue with uh, you? So again, uh, you, you've been a CISO in the past and now you're you are heading up this uh, this very uh, impactful non nonprofit called Educause. What have you seen in terms of skill sets that have endured, let's say over the last 15 years that, that still continues to reverberate and number one, and the follow up to that, uh, new skills that are becoming almost mandatory for anybody to succeed in cybersecurity today? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, it's sort of that uh, idea of relationships, right? And, 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 you know, I joke about connecting and collecting, right? So I think, you know, whether you're just entering this, this field or you've been, you know, a, a CISO for a decade or more um, or, or a solutions provider like Artie, you really, it's relationships. We work, you know, that's one of the reasons we're all here together on this, this panel is it's, you work with people, you know. So I think the skill set of having to be able to cultivate and maintain relationships at the beginning of your career, throughout your career, are so important no matter what side of this that you're on. And I think, you know, the second question, you know, that's sort of become more important through COVID in 2020, where we're sort of distributed and we don't have the face-to-face -face interactions that we used to have. Um, so you really have to be purposeful about those relationships and, and those connections. And I think um, we'll talk a little bit more about sort of some other things, but I think learning and, and, and adapting is a huge benefit in this, um, in this field. Arzi, I'm sure you have uh, your thoughts to add. Yeah, definitely. So I'll, I'll echo the whole relationship, but only because I think most of the time forward progress in our field actually comes on trust and trust comes from relationships. So definitely would echo that. Uh, from the vendor perspective, though, I think it's about the problem-solving mindset. And this is true from any solution provider, but, but cybersecurity specifically, right? Because we've got this very active adversary that we are trying to uh, protect against. And so bringing the people with the problem-solving skills and the you know, persistence to stay on top of new problems is I think super important from a vendor perspective. And that brings with it a whole lot of other stuff like, hey, you gotta learn new things. You gotta to wanna to learn new things. You know, the, you know, the whole um, environment will change year to year. You know, the attack strategies change from year to year. So you have to be that person. You have to be a bit tireless almost, right? So you kind of wanna learn and adapt and formulate new answers to challenging questions. So I think uh, I'm, I'm going to ask a question that I was yeah. uh, posed many years ago, actually, when I first yeah. started podcasting. Right? This was uh, uh, an excess of a fairly large name brand. And okay. she was getting harassed with these vendor inbounds, right? And one day what yeah. she did was she actually took her entire calendar, obviously uh, grayed out the specifics, right? Yeah. Took a PDF and sent it to the vendor saying, you're asking me for 15 minutes of your time. I have my bio breaks calendared in. How and why do I do you think I should meet you, right? So, so one question to ask is, and like you're saying, I mean, you're trying to figure out as a as a solution provider uh, where your customer is right now in terms of his or her priorities list, where where do you fit in, right? And, and sometimes you want to ignore that because you want to get your voice heard. But on the yeah. flip side, if you see if you to see uh, this person's calendar and say, okay, she has no time. Right now, how how would you kind of navigate that to even understand if the yeah. value that you're providing even fits within her uh, her data? Yeah. No, that's a great question. So for me, 
my mantra is stick to the substance. So, you know, even when starting the company, we want to pick a problem that's really important that is urgently needing to be solved. And I think if you stick to the substance, then you don't have to go and chase after people and like, you know, shout and spend a million dollars in marketing because, you know, you say it in one place and it's a real problem and it just finds a way to the right. So that, that is my mantra, it works for me. Uh, and so, you know, when all I do essentially is say, this is the problem that we solve. And if you have this problem, then we would be interested in chatting and sticking to the substance is my answer, yeah. So Brian, uh, I saw this really interesting B2B marketing uh, post on LinkedIn, which actually talked about um, uh, how technology buyers make their decision, right? And I think 66% was uh, uh, divided uh, or uh, two thirds was essentially the buyer doing their own research, right? Yeah. This was not vendor webinars. It wasn't even analyst things. It's like, so uh, again, given your sense of background, again, where you are right now, educating others, uh, what, I mean, what sort of skill sets do you think need uh, the security buyer needs to have to be able to kind of go and do this kind of independent uh, assessment before they even knock on the door? Yeah, and I think it, it sort of lends to to Artie's point, uh, and I think you know I agree 100% with sort of that that learning, that hunger, that yearning, lifelong learning, right? So that that buyer is going to do that research. They want to understand what's you know they know what their problem is, and they're looking for you know what are the solutions to that problem. So I think you know the relationship, the trust, the you know the confidence comes from. When you do that research, finding a solution provider that is sort of articulating answers to your questions, right? So it it feeds into that learning mindset that I think many of us bring. That you know, we talk about lifelong learning, and and yeah. I think you know, already talked about the you know the, the technology changes. And I, t I I've taught at a community college level for a number of years, and I joke about if if you want to go to college and be done, you know, math or medicine, you know, hasn't really changed, and you know. <laughs> And you can get a, an accounting degree and go off and do that. But the career field that we're in, in cybersecurity or in IT, you're always going to be learning. So I think that seeking answers is, is really important. And I think to, to Artie's point about um, you know, looking for partners that provide sort of answers to the questions yeah. you may have, right? Instead of those relentless calls where you know, it starts with, tell me about your problems and then I'll tell you how to solve them, right? As a, as a you know, sort of a career buyer prior to joining Educause, you know, I wanted the first interaction to be the solution that was coming forward, not, you know, the ask for what, you know, the laundry list of my problems that they, that, you know, and that learning goes both ways that the solution provider had learned specifically about higher ed and specifically about my university and specifically about the challenges that we were having and then came and offered a product or a solution that really resonated with me. I'm like, okay, they, they know I'm different than JP Morgan. They know I'm different than, you know, a, another large vendor or healthcare side. And this is someone I'm going to trust and listen to. And I think, you know, that, you know, I, I, that really resonated with me, right. Is the relationships and the trust, yeah. right. You, you have relationships with, with, with people that you trust in businesses yeah. that you trust and, and, knowing that I think is foundational. So, um, yeah. that was a long, long answer to a short yeah. question. Sorry. Ashwin, uh, can I add a little absolutely. bit? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. So I was going to say that I found the frameworks are helpful on both sides. So, you know, when people go in and when I go talk about cybersecurity or the problems we solve, if I put it in the context of a MITRE or an Australian cyber defense, something, right? A framework that you're familiar with, then the other side has an easy time as well. And often I find the CISOs do the same thing. They'll go research, they'll put their environment in the context of a MITRE and say, okay, he's, here are my gaps. You're nodding, so I assume you're resonating with that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And so one thing, and again, this, this hit me uh, once I took uh, a breather away from the, from the vendor space and got into this, I don't know what space this is in, but it's engaging with, uh, with, with uh, CISOs and buyers. But uh, one of the things that hit me, and again, uh, Brian, maybe I should have known this, and Arthi, I should have known this as a, as a vendor for 20 plus years, but I did not, is how close-knit the yeah. CISO community is, right? And the impact of that was, was, like I said, in one of my conversations, it was, 
Um, and they were telling me that this was about a year and a half ago. There was a slab group of about 1,300, 1,400 CISO, right? And what he was telling me was essentially, you say, Ashwin, if you're a vendor, you come to me, you overpromise, under deliver. I will just post that on Slack, right? And post the vendor name over there. And there are 1,400 CISOs who are watching that. Now, if you knew that you were red flag, you could potentially do something about it. But the funny part is you won't even know. So what that means is your POCs will take 10x longer. Renewals will not happen, <laughs> right? Uh, right? And we will negotiate the heck out of it to make sure that you're getting literally nothing out of it. Right? So the point is, how does a vendor, I think I'm going to ask you this question, right? I mean, yeah. from your perspective, right? Uh, how do you figure out where you are in the CISO totem pole? Right at the end of the day, I mean, it's all about trust. But then, we've all seen this, right? One bad sales, one uh, thing that you forget, forgot to disclose a vulnerability or a CVE that you had, and the customer gets screwed. That sticks with you. And sometimes you move on. You said, "Hey, I'm this new project, new one." But no, like you are who you are, and you made you, you messed up in the past, and that's going to continue to plague you, right? So, how does a vendor navigate through that? Yeah. Well, you know, again, my principles are basically: you have a code of conduct you stick to it, you're sincere about it, and you honor that trust. And if you make a mistake, you own up to it. You don't go and blame the customer saying, hey, look, it's in my documentation. You didn't read the fine print, right? Because just like other relationships, these are partnerships. And in security specifically, you, you sell security, but unfortunately you can't guarantee security because there's no 100% guarantee against what the adversary is going to do. So you have to be completely transparent and you know, go into it with disclosure. And after that, you're going to navigate it together. So if you don't treat it as a partnership, you look at them as a cash register, that's a problem, right? And I think that's the best we can do from our side. And for me personally, um, I make sure I stay on top of all of those you know, disclosures, et cetera, so that I don't have people in my organization you know, representing something that I'm going to have to go back and not be able to defend. But that's as far as I'm able to take it. And, you know, luckily for me, that's worked out. But I think for other vendors too, it's that, uh, it's that disclosure that we need to do, take up front. Brian, final question for you, right? From a diversity and inclusion perspective, how important it is to have a diverse opinion uh, or a group of people with diverse skill set to be able to ask the right set of questions versus uh, this, this single-minded thinking? Uh, it's it's so important. I you know I think that's one of the things we advocate for. And there's such debate in this community around you know what skill sets, what uh, yeah. academic backgrounds you should have. But I think diversity of thought, diversity of thinking. We're seeing more on the awareness side of the house with social scientists and psychologists, and you know we're we're a bunch of geeks and nerds, right? And in having other disciplines help us think about these complex problems, I think is hugely important. So. You know, we advocate for that. I think that's going to be the future is really having more of a diverse background, educational background. And, you know, and I think, too, some of us are wired to, you know, our professionally, we're supposed to get we're supposed to be right all the time. Right. We have to <laughs> we have to be right 100 percent of the time. And if we're wrong once, the adversary can get through. And I think, yeah. you know, we have to learn a little bit to be able to say that, you know, there might be other ideas. We might not always be right. And, and to, you know, be a little bit more humble about our thinking uh, as a profession is important. And that will help with, you know, our, our diversity, equity, and inclusion challenges just because sometimes we're closed-minded as, as CISO. So I think that's an important future to think about. Great. Uh, again, thanks for your time, Arati. Thanks for your time, uh, Brian. Looking forward to catching up in the future. Thank you. Thanks.